And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one, two, three, four good brothers. Ha 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 ha. We have the 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 last Cowboys apologist currently recovering. Good brother Cure. We have the ma the man of a th the man of a thousand contracts who wants you to seal the deal. Good brother JT. We have we have the the man guiding you through all of your VTubers under a p on top of his soapbox under a pair of red sunglasses. Good brother Shades, and we have the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xenatrix. <laughs> but it is April 10th. We are ba we are back once again with Ge with Geek Watch and as you as you all can see our focus this week is what what I'm what we are calling madness without method with some interesting representatives in the matter and we'll be going into a good amount of them as we go on with this. But the origin of this particular episode idea is one that was a bit of an audible and one that has a bit of an origin story. And for that, Brother Shades, I will let you handle that. channel just a moment ago and for those of you who know some call me johnny this started as the as my sonic 06 this oh my <laughs> because there is a reason the man at the center of this whole of this little splash screen of ours is a certain blonde haired buff boy because for anyone who has known my history, there is one anime that I have considered, well, I guess the best analogy would be my Xanatrix, the bane of my fucking existence! <laughs> I've become an epithet! It's great! <laughs> yes, folks. And of course, for those who don't know, that anime is bo 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 I have, ever since I first saw this abomination on my television screen back during the, during the dying days of Toonami, or at least the first iteration, I have had a seething hatred for this pile of garbage, and yes, no. I have minced no words with this one, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh! And as my time as an anime reviewer... I had, at one point, reviewed this series. In fact, it was actually a crossover with uh, another uh, reviewer during the Reviewerverse days. However, that reviewer felt was, I'll be honest, not very good, and shortly after fell off the face of the earth. However, I did have the footage, so I just re-edited it to make it my own. That being said, as some of you might be aware, I've since had to take down all those videos because of copyright uh, bullshit from Japan. Fuck you, show pro. Uh, fuck, you, fuck you hard. And not in the pleasant way. That being said, this left a, get an, a hole in my, uh, in my soul because I need closure on this one. But, as the monk put it, just talking about this one anime isn't enough. Because while I could shit on Boba Boba all day long, one of the things we do best around here is we talk, we compare it to better contemporaries. So if we're going to talk about why Boba Bo drives me up a goddamn wall, we need to compare it to stuff that do, does similar things and does it better. Because they're, the biggest problem with Boba Bo is the matter of randomness. It is a, sh it is a parody series, for those who don't know. It is a, mostly a parody of... The old school shonen anime, and the prime example would be that of Fist of the North Star. Because, and I'm not even making this up, Bobo Bo's primary form of combat 
is known as Snot For You or Fist of the Nose Hair. <laughs> Already you can see why I hate this show. But trust me, tip of the fucking iceberg. Mm -hmm. But we'll get into that in a little bit once we really dive into this shit. But it's, it's attempt at parody just came down to throwing random shit at the screen and hoping you'll accept it as comedy. I will. We will be soon explain why this did not work, even if although, some of you think it did. Although you can understand that even though I know that didn't actually work, I still found it one of those popcorn, just sit there, turn off your brain and laugh at it things. I myself am a huge fan of the absurd, of absurdity, of uh, absurdist philosophy, but that's a different episode, and uh, just absurd comedy. I like it when things go off the rails to what the, what, and I don't even know where I am anymore. I, uh, it's just, it's very cathartic and just very, I mean, my favorite, my favorite movie is The Blues Brothers, and that just goes Way out. It, by the end of that movie, anybody who's seen it, you know how way off the rails it's going. So, in Illinois yeah, no. Nazis. D don't don't get me in wrong. In Pintos. In Pintos. But uh, do not. <laughs> but to, but to, to, I'm just saying, I I I do not find Bobo Bo as offensive as Brother Shade as Brother Shades here. Uh, yeah, and, the, and do not mistake me on this. I enjoy me some absurd comedy. In fact, at least three of the other anime featured on that screen. I actually enjoy, though one of them I haven't fully seen, admittedly, and it's the one you're probably going to hate me for not seeing yet, but that's not the point. But we'll two of them I have seen. We'll get to it. We'll get to those. Two of those I have seen, and I thoroughly enjoy, despite them also being random as fuck. But there are reasons why those worked, and in my opinion, Bobo Bo didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. you also, as I recall, since I did catch that episode before, before you had to take it down. In fact, I think I commented on the re on the re up of it. Um, you have a you have a bit of perspective on the matter because years ago you interviewed the anime dad Richard Epcar. Yes, uh, for those who don't know, Richard Epcar was the voice of Bobolo himself. And one of the interesting things about that was I had originally pet uh, created a joke for that video where I said that. Richard, when he originally looked at the script for that, probably thought he was out of that. The, the the people behind it were out of their fucking gourd, and only took the job because he was going to get paid pretty well for it. Well, I was half right <laughs> because when I interviewed Mr. Epcar, and that interview I believe is still up and available for you to check out for verification on this, Richard himself admitted to me that originally he did, in fact, did not. Uh, he originally did, in fact, turn down the role. He thought it was absolutely insane. But it was only through persistence and pure stubbornness on the part of the staff of the show, or at least the dubbing staff, that he finally accepted the job as not only the main character, but also ADR director. Aha. Uh -huh. And he does say that he has gone on to appreciate the work he did on that show, and uh, far be it for me to shit on him for that. Again, I've always said, never blame the actor. In this case, I can't even blame him as the director because, well, he was the one directing it. And for what it's worth, they tried their damnedest to make it work. It's just that when you have that absolute insanity, you can only do so much. And <laughs> this was this wasn't a case of um of of um of be of just of just being able to throw things at the wall like you like you could with the one that everyone likes to bring up ghost stories because because this was go this was going to be on Toonami, so you had to have at least a little bit of professionalism. Yeah, not like they could do much with it because this is the the material. Unlike Ghost Stories, that was so fucking bland that adding something to it would have actually improved it. Here, no, this was already completely off the walls, insane. That trying to make it even funnier would have probably just been overkill. Mm hmm. Anyway. Now, the focus that this is where this is where I came into the picture because as I, as as I'm as I brought it up when you when um you had a back and forth with so, with someone we're familiar with who who um was delving into it 
Oh, I had said that just covering it alone wouldn't be wouldn't be enough. The reason I said that is, well, just co just covering a a single sh a single show who, that we never saw that we never completely saw the airing because I was only watching it as far as as far as the tsunami run of it was going, and even and even then, after a while, I ended up fa I ended up phasing out. <laughs> but. I rem I remember saying that saying that it felt it felt like a pale imitation of other absurd works, and that's where the idea of madness without method came to came to me. Yeah, because truth be told, there are a, t a good number of other anime out there that have done this same kind of absurdist, off-the-wall insane anime, and somehow those ones worked. Oh, they worked really well, too. Absolutely. No, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. In fact, I think the best example, especially since it came out roughly around the same time, is that of Excel Saga. I uh, uh, in the years past, I went back and watched Excel Saga, and I'll straight up say it: I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I still get whenever I even think about Excel Saga, I start hearing "Ai no Chuseishin," the theme song, in my head and want to sing along. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's a, it's a freaking bop. It really it is. It really is. It, and it, it also embodies the whole oh, fucking show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. You, You've you've got you've got the you've got uh one girl just singing about random shit and then you've got the other girl just coughing up her blood all over the place because that's what she does at the fucking show. Thank you, Hyatt, for being super anemic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, also, uh, I I believe that was one of Monica Rial's first roles too. <laughs> the one I'm very yeah. familiar with. Mm -hmm. Well, I I don't recall the exact actress, but I believe uh, uh, with the dub, uh, Excel was voiced by one lady, and then they. Then she uh, uh, she uh, resigned from the role halfway through because she couldn't keep the voice up and it actually damaged her vocal cords. Mm. So, they, so they actually swapped in a second actress for like the last ten episodes or something like that. <laughs> Hold on, I'll double check that for you right here. Yeah, ch fact yeah check it started out with Jessica uh, Jessica Calvello, I believe, was the one that first started it, and then they yeah, she was great. Uh, mm -hmm. She was great. She was fucking fantastic. But then, yeah, they had to replace her later on with Larissa Wolcott. Mm -hmm. Let's also let's also not um, let's also n not forget that this is actually one of those times where JC staff made something awesome, not uh, that Excel wasn't that, that <laughs> no that wasn't harem shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's mainly because of the man who actually held into this little project, a legendary creator known as Sh nah. Shinichi Watanabe. Nabe Shin. Shin. Fucking Nabe <laughs> Shin. That man is a legend of insanity, and it is glorious. He's just a le he's just a legend in life, dude. Just in the whole grand scheme of the universe of this Earth of this planet, Nabashin is legend. <laughs> yes, yeah, I do not. I'd disagree. say he, I'd say he's one of the rare few um, dire directors who could get away with putting him with putting himself in an anime because, let's face it, the way he show the way he shows up at um at conventions or other appearances, he may as well be a <laughs> he may as well be an anime character. Um, well, yeah, that's... for those who have never seen Nabe Shin in person, he has a very distinct look about him that is in instantly recognizable. His he outfit is... is based heavily on Lupin the Third with the, the, the colored suit, mm -hmm. usually a red suit with a uh, blue sh undershirt and a white and a yellow tie. Uh, and, of course, he always rocking a pair of sunglasses, which already makes him a winner in my book. <laughs> and he's almost, and up until very, very recently, he's almost always got an afro. Yeah, and he rocks and it, and it, it looks full, good. <laughs> it does. And it's a full-on round afro. It's not like some half-ass fro that you see some people know. This is a full-on poof, poofy fro. This is this not is a Jew fro. Yeah, this is not a Jew, bro. This is the real deal, and he makes it work. And yeah, he he because of that, he's easily easily able to introduce him, uh, put himself into any show 
as a character. Though, he never really... He, here's the thing. Here's how he makes it work. He never self-inserts himself as the main character. He's usually just some side character that comes in for appearances throughout the show. And any of you who have seen Excel Saga know exactly which character he is, because it's also named Nabeshin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he doesn't exactly hide himself. <laughs> I have only, you know, there's no opacity. No. Oh, so. uh, I just looked. I just looked up what else he's done. Yeah. He did Ra something. Oh, he did something. He did something similar, but in my warehouse. What did it? I think uh, he's referring to Poemi, which um. It's have... a sequel to Excel Saga. Yeah. Unoffic unofficially. And, I mean, um... it, it, and Nabeshin is her dad in that story. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being honest, I think I think JT said it best with, with me the other day when he said, he said that Poemi may, may, should have may was a Someone's situation where someone should have told him no. Someone should have. Someone probably should have said something. I didn't say it was good. Poemi's <laughs> okay. So let's be fair there too. Poemi is not bad. It's just it 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 cannot live up to Excel Saga. There's nothing that can. Mm -hmm. It was no. okay in my opinion. Just but, okay. But since but we have I... since we have the two th the two bits of comparison, because even back then I was comparing Boba Bo to Excel Saga. Not because I wanted to, but because, but because with the inevitable. level of absurdity, one, it was inevitable, and two, I can't help but wonder if, if on some level they were trying to they were trying to st stack up to that level. Um, I do remember the the manga also also getting a getting a run in English. Um, I only know about it because I saw it on bookshelves. Obviously, I didn't read and I didn't buy it. <laughs> For Boba Bo or, or uh, Excel Saga? Well, both of them had a mo both of them had a manga run. Mm -hmm. um, the Excel Saga one I actually did read at least it's the first few chapters. It was pretty good. The Boba Bo one I didn't read because I don't hate money enough to do that to it. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think I think I think you could almost you could almost make the argument that Boba Bo is like visually is probably taking a shot at Nabe Shin considering the blue shirt and the giant afro. I could, I could, uh, but at t as time went on, I was try I couldn't figure out what exactly, what exactly Boba Bo was trying to take a shot at. I mean, at, at the very least, ex with something like Excel Saga, you have, you have a structure, and this is where that whole madness and method co come into play. If you you can do all the randomness, all the absurdity that you want. But you need a foundation. With yeah. Excel Saga, you have the foundation of an evil organization that doesn't really do all that much. An evil exactly. organization based on an old dojin that he had made, which uh, we have the heroes from that old dojin in there as well. Municipal Force Daitenzin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, there th there, there, there's a grounding there that while it doesn't really make a big difference, like it doesn't become a big plot. It's still enough to give you an idea of why they are doing the crazy shit they're doing. Mm -hmm. And to an extent, Boba Bo does have that early at on. First. Yeah, at first. The the early premise is that there's this army of soldiers who want to make the world bald. <laughs> again, think of the king character. And, and they try and, and again, this is where that whole Fist of the North Star comparison comes in, because that's what they were going for. Boba Bo was supposed to be their allegory for Ken, or their their version of Kenshiro. You know, fist of the nose hair, fist of the North Star, you get you get it. And a bunch of other fists, but yeah, that's Oh yeah, that, yeah. There's a whole bunch, a bunch of crazy of shit. shit. But but as time went on, they started just changing up the plot structure, and it just got more and more ridiculous as time went on. And before long, it had very little, if any, connection to that main to that original premise, and that just made all the more uh, the absurd moments that much more nonsensical. You know, if you, if the randomness has some sense of connection to things. 
while yeah, you may say it doesn't make it still do, doesn't make it as random, it can still be very random. So it has you to know? have some tangential relation to reality, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, some tangential connection to at least what the idea is, what the premise is going to be, even if it's just for that episode. And a lot of the jokes in Excel Saga did that, you know. That that was kind of the thing. But with Boba Bo, there are num there are countless times where not only do certain jokes just not make any sense on the narrative they're trying to create, but can oftentimes detract from the narrative they're trying to create. And that's where problems start to go. And no more is this apparent than with one very specific character that more than anybody else infuriates me on a degree that I have never felt with any other anime character in my fucking life. And his name is Don fucking Patch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a very specific reason why I try to avoid mentioning him every time I'm around, every time I'm around Shade. Yes. Here it goes. For those who never saw my original video, the minute I got to, the minute I got to talking about Don Patch in my review, I literally lost my fucking mind. I literally went on a laughing fit of pure rage. Oi, oi. Because this was the character that broke the anime for me more than anything else. You know, up until his introduction, the randomness was tolerable. It was stupid. It was nonsensical. And sometimes it went a little off the rails. But it was tolerable. Soon as he showed up, Everything came to screeching halts for the sake of dumbass jokes. And the big problem, which they referred to as wigging out, and the big problem with the with the jokes is not too far removed from the cutaway problem that Family Guy descended into, where you're doing best, you're doing more story, cutaways yes. than you're doing your actual story. Yeah. And even if even if it is a comedy, you still ha you still have to ha once again you still have to have a foundation, and more importantly, you have to stick to it, not religiously, but even if you even if you even if you veer outside of it, you eventually do have to come back to Rome, to put a spin on that whole all roads lead to Rome, um story. Exactly. And this is where Bobovo, in my opinion, fail. Because very often, these cutaway gags literally led to nothing. Except more they cutaway did... gags. Except yes. more cutaway gags. Like, there were literally times where we went full Inception and had a cutaway gag into a cutaway gag into a cutaway gag. Yes, folks, we uh... went three layers deep and you don't do that. <laughs> Unless you're playing Inception, but that's different. And Not without a totem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the only time yeah. it's the only time it seemed to have gotten to some le some level of sanity was when Captain Battleship was introduced. <laughs> I say I guess well sanity is the wrong word. I guess structure would be a better word. But then but then Captain Battleship, who you would think would be the be our um, big our big rival character if if we're going by tropes, but then he gets replaced by a torpedo, and then we're right back to the wigging out bullshit. And yeah, it was shortly after that that I ended up losing interest, largely because it I felt like I felt like the whatever story was in this thing the had gotten away from the writer. Whereas you con now you contrast this kind of thing with the with a cross in Excel Saga. A cross is meant to be this e this evil organization this um organization bent on world domination that only has two members and what and one guy who is who is bored out of his mind while his subordinates are out doing things. Well, well, and. One other mysterious leader above even Il Palazzo, mm -hmm. who becomes plot relevant later. Yeah. Anohito. But the point the point is 
because of the fact that it that it focuses on this completely dysfunctional quote unquote evil organization that you... has to have the great will of the macrocosm constantly reset the story because Excel keeps dying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm getting such a nostalgia bomb with this conversation. It's fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's it definitely deserves that because yeah, yeah. The, the, again, the jokes, even the most absurd jokes in that story, eventually tie into everything. Like even like stuff like the complete side story that is the the story of Pedro, eventually ties its way back into the main main narrative. The story of. Pedro Nabeshin and that man. Yes, <laughs> that man, that man trying to steal my sexy wife. <laughs> I never get to. I need to get back to my sexy wife. My good friend Gomez is helping her. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous and it takes a while for that to become like relevant to everything but eventually like near the end of the ser series it does start to at least interweave into the main narrative to where it actually belongs then it's like okay so it actually went somewhere great awesome yeah yeah <laughs> also I've, i'd be remiss if i didn't point out one bit one particular troll move that the that the anime did where the final episode was made too was made too was was made too violent obscene and long for Japanese television and was only on the um, DVD release though it had since been broadcast elsewhere you know yeah kind of That's almost like I, nice boat before its time well it's also <laughs> it, it was made that way on purpose too mm-hmm like, it yeah. legitimately was made to be even more over the top than everything else that had come before it. And nowhere is this more evident than from the cold open gags. Every every episode of Excel Saga opens with, I, Koshi Rito, approve <laughs> this episode of Excel Saga to be such and such idea. Such and such genre or theme or whatever. There's one for literally every episode. And in the final episode that was only on DVDs, the corporation actually shows up along with, like, kind of being represented by a cross in other ways, and Nabation, and, well, etc. Um, they're like, we want to make Excel Saga a musical! And they start singing, and Koshiriko's like, no way! No way is Excel Saga going to be a musical! And he's singing it! Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it is the most absurd motherfucking thing! And it is still fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, 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 have, I have the Thin Pack DVD. I've had it for like the last 20 years. And I've only watched it once. So now y'all are giving me uh, motivation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, also, if there's any evidence that th this last episode was not meant to be, was intentionally made to be not airable on TV, little fun fact, it was actually made a minute too long to air on television stations. They intentionally made it a longer episode, even just by a single minute, just to fuck with them. So and, basic, well, basically, in a way, the reverse, the reverse of the original ending, the Evangel the Evangelion TV series. If I'm being <laughs> honest, if there's if there's a Western analogy that I could make with something with um, Excel Saga in terms of that level of absurdity, Sam and Max. Oh my yes! God! Yeah. Yeah! Yes! Sam and Max works. Yeah. Oh. That's a perfect analogy. Since you have you have one of you have one of them who's the crazy one and the other one who's the brains <laughs> in quotations. <laughs> yeah. In quotations. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah, heavy quotations on that one. <laughs> oh. I got to get going, guys. All right. All right, later. Bye. See you, Kier. But there the thing is, the thing is with with absurdity you you know how there's the uncanny valley with um things that with, with appear yeah things that things that are hum things that are human looking enough just to disturb you there has to be th there has to be a degree of things looking normal enough to make the, to make the absurd actually absurd there's a reason what? why in why one of the why one of the most common roles 
in any comedy work, whether whether going all the way back to the days of vaudeville, you need to have a straight man. Yeah, I I think I I think I've figured out the absurd needs rea- needs grounded reality to basically collide with and create a contrast, yes. which you know which which is which you know triggers the humor uh, rece- uh, reaction in the brain. And this is where Bobobo fails because Bobobo's world is completely unrealistic. It has yeah. no basis in reality whatsoever whatsoever. Their, their only attempt at any kind of reality grounding was with their audience surrogate character Beauty. But in all honesty, she often was just as silly as a lot of the cast, even if she never went as crazy as they did. But a lot of her reactions, a lot of her mannerisms didn't really give her enough to gr- to be that grounding force. And there like was... you said, the world around it did not help. In something like no, Gintama. No, contra- no contrast. Exactly. Yeah, the, well, with, with Beauty, the thing that annoyed me was that her reactions to things started to get a little repetitive. But Literally, they, they would literally use the exact same reactions for certain scenes. Yeah. Um, to use Gint, to use something like Gintama, the 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 straight man is Shinpachi. Hi. <laughs> well, he, I mean, no one else can be monk. It's kind of that's that's process of elimination at that at that point. <laughs> yeah, oh. but it, the bad point is there's still something there. Mm-hmm. True. And with something like Excel, with Excel Saga, you could. You could argue that Hyatt is the is the is the straight woman. No, the, the to no a, that to a stretch. That that's a big stretch. The the straight oh, people, the straight people in that are um, it, ironically Il Palato in many cases, mm. even though he doesn't really do much, and um, most of like all of Daitenzin actually. They call out Kabapu as fucking ridiculous. They call out Across as, ridicu- as ridiculous. They call out Nabashin and Pedro when they sometimes pop up as ridiculous. Dai Tenzin is basically the, the audience surrogate going, what the fuck is going on here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, yeah. I sp- to, f- to further go into these kind of comparisons, I, w- I want to delve, I want to delve into... A few fail, a few fail examples at absurdity, in diff, th- but they f- but they fail in different ways. And the first one is Bokusatsu Tenshi Dokoro Chan or Club to Death Dokoro Chan. Club to Death Angel. Yeah, I think the official English title was Bludgeoning Angel Dokoro Chan. Yeah, I just call her Club to Death Angel because that sounds funnier. Yeah, it does. I agree. Where be-do, you're... Be-do, 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 be. uh, First, I'd say that I'd say that's going to be the lasting legacy is that particular meme. <laughs> yeah, there's there's actually what Good Brother JT has been a uh, has been quoting is uh, Dokuro Chan's chant that she has to say in order to revive the main character she keeps fucking killing. Um, and when we say killing, uh, there's a reason she's called Bludgeoning Angel. Because, as you might have seen on the splash screen, she holds a giant club mace, or a spike Excalibur- club. Excalibur- Excalibur- <laughs> and uh, she uses that thing to violent degrees. I know, I've never watched the show itself, but I have, I have seen at least one clip where she literally swings it so hard, it literally cleaves his head in half. Mm-hmm. Cle- cleaves it right off, yep. Um... And that's that's actually par for the course with with uh, Bokusatsu Tenshi Dokuro Chan. Uh, most things are so violent in that show um, that there's ex- there's some pretty extreme gore. Um, also, monkeys for some reason. Monkeys are a thing, yes. But no. <laughs> then then there's the the weird thing of well, if you remove the halo of a of a uh, of a of a of an angel, she gets diarrhea. For no goddamn reason. And also, the halos are so fucking sharp, they'll cut your hand off! Mm-hmm. It, it, while, again, this is one of those shows that I enjoyed as a turn-off-your-brain-and-kind-of-just-vibe, 
um, it, it definitely fails to really establish anything other than the fact that the main character, who at this point is a child, um, is going to somehow be responsible for turning the entire world into a world of adult men and women who have been biologically stopped from growing physically. They still grow into sexual maturity, but growing physically beyond the age of 12. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, she's been, she's been uh, sent back to correct his behavior to prevent that ending, which, from all intents and purposes... Terminator 2 style. Well, no. She's, she's, she's not been sent back to kill him and prevent it altogether. Um, but what's really implied, even in the first couple episodes, is her presence is what makes him make them that way in the first place because he falls in love with her. Kind of a like yeah, the good old, kills him all the time. The good old kind of a catch-22. Yeah, and with this one, you have a... You... You have a case of throwing a bunch of things at the wall and seeing and seeing what would stick, as opposed to having an idea and that and never sticking with it. Yeah, I I love all the comedy moments disparately. Like each comedy moment will make me laugh if I just watch that comedy moment. It's not hard. Um, they're they're good gags. They're good visual gags. They're good. They're good. Um, sometimes even social or spoken gags. But how it all ties together starts to is where it really, really starts to fall apart. You know how certain movies or certain sh or certain shows end up getting remembered more for their potential as gifts or memes. That's what we have. Yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or 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 clips on AMV. Exactly. <laughs> That's where I first came across the show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the gags early on has to do with her catchphrase. She has specifically stated pee pee doo pee doo pee pee doo pee pee is the shortened version. And there's one point where they show the full version. It's two and a half minutes of that stock footage and sound just repeating. That's not funny. No. That, that's not funny. That's, you... endless, that's, that's endless eight syndrome right there. That's, that's not funny. Or modern day family guy. Oh. <laughs> I'd say I'd say it I'd say it feels like a poor man's version of the, of either a the comedy game or b um Jugemu Jugemu. We're not doing yeah, the Ju full name. <laughs> yeah, but Jugemu Jugemu is funny because it's it's a story being told, and you realize that the absurdity is that everybody says his full name instead of shortening it, and in so doing, the punchline is it took so long to say his name so many times this kid no longer has a bump on his head. And and of course, of course, it, of course, that joke would get re would get revived with the outtakes for Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And eh? oh, not not the outtakes, but the um, but the omake, because that was used as a gag regarding what's regarding what um, Scar and Pride's actual names are. My actual name is Jugemu Jugemu. Oh, your na actual name is also Jugemu Jugemu. I see. I'm, of course, shortening it. Mm -hmm. For brevity's sake. Yeah. The clip's available on YouTube. You can find it easily. Um, I feel yeah. bad for I feel bad for the translators when they had to try and tri um, turn that joke into English and make it work. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd if I were to use... I'd say in that regard, it's not far removed from how a lot of people remember B-movie more from the memes than actually seeing it. Yeah. Or from the fact that people tried to post the entire fucking script in places it didn't belong. Hi, Seth. <laughs> oh. If you don't know, Seth made a custom quest for Heroes of Might and Magic 5 that was the entire script of B-Movie. I'm well aware. <laughs> I know. I just I just had to catch, catch everybody else up. But since we've... But um, the other... The other bit of absurdity that I, th that I think is worth talking about, in terms of in terms of just get in terms of just gag speed, because if you want to do a show based entirely around gags, you can do that. And yeah. there are two, per there are two particular shows that are on the screen right now that are perfect examples of this. One of them, of course, being the classic that is Azamanga Dayo, which which. 
Oh, started out at which started out as a four coma. So it so its anime being gag focused certainly makes sense. Translating yeah. a, a four coma into a gag anime isn't hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would say Azamangan Dio was taking it was is in a very similar vein to again the to shows like we mentioned before like uh or shows like Lucky Star because that was kind of the same thing it was a, just a bunch of four comas that they turned into a full on series but Azamanga Dio took that to basically its logical extreme mm-hmm. <laughs> and the and let's let's i think a lot of people have forgotten what the term sitcom comes from Situational yeah. comedy. And in that in that same vein, a lot of a lot of the gags are just about having a set of simple characters in different in different situations. Um, I do I do recall what I do recall one gag that I, that that I that I utilized was um was the was ever was um the class dealing with get, getting back getting back into school after summer <laughs> and and Chio having to constantly tell them to get motivated <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> admittedly is the the problem with the problem with some with some with trying to do some comedy anime is some of the jokes are going to be harder to do in English just because just because of Japanese humor or as um as easy would put it Japanese word play it's fun <laughs> and have you Japan and your sparkling word play <laughs> and um <laughs> I'd say I'd, of course, of course, for me, whenever I think of Azamanga Dayo, I end up thinking of the cat that is not a cat, mostly because <laughs> oh, of God. who's voicing him. Because he's God, <laughs> and, vo- and, he, and he's voiced by God. <laughs> yeah, and apparently, apparently, even though he is not a ca- even though despite appearances, he is not a cat, but for some reason, he he has he is a Nekojita. Oh my god! <laughs> and I re- I remember I remember someone decided that they were going to have a bit of fun by giving um, by giving his lines to M Bison because it's Norio Wakamoto and titled the video M Bison is not a cat. Yep. <clears throat> which is which is how we get which is how we got hello every nyam. <laughs> I miss that man. And of course, in the, of course, in that same gag-based approach, you have Cromartie High School, which has its own has its own. First off, once again, we have Norio Wakamoto vo- being somebody who doesn't quite belong in the setting that he's in. <laughs> when does Norio Wakamoto ever belong, though? No, I don't think he does. He ever does. Like the the last show I ever saw him in was Planet With, which I highly recommend. Which I highly recommend. It's a twelve episode I, series, but it feels like a thirty six episode series. It's got so much jam packed in it. JT, really, I reviewed really that good. show back in the day, and I wholeheartedly agree. That is an underrated gem. Mm-hmm. Planet With I mean, is fantastic. It's it's by the same guy who did Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer and Spirit Circle. So Lucifer you cannot- and the Biscuit Hammer. <clears throat> Lucifer yeah. and the Biscuit Hammer is getting an anime soon. Hot damn! I wish I could find the manga again. They it was licensed. It was licensed stateside, but then it got phased out. I guess it didn't sell. Anyway, anyway, uh, but hot dog. Um, but anyway, yeah. But the the, the Dorian Wakamoto, the last role I ever saw him play was he played a a giant talking alien space dog, a dog, just no reason, just a giant talking dog. So. <laughs> it, St- yeah, I I think Norio Wakamoto just inserting him into a place where he doesn't belong is kind of like becoming a real life meme at this point in the industry. <laughs> I kind of wonder. Um, 
I think the only t the only time where he's able to fit is whenever he's doing a villain role. Oh. Yeah, like like a uh, supercell or something like that. Whether it be Cell, whether it be Charles V. Britannia, or um Nobunaga Oda. Hi, hi. Or <clears throat> <laughs> Norio Wakamoto is Father Alexander Anderson in Helsing Ultimate. Let's not forget that. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do remember when I was doing. I don't, I don't know if he, I don't, I don't remember if he ended up voicing it, but when I was doing fan casting for the original The City, I was like, we need to have Wakamoto play Chaos. <laughs> I don't think he did. No, he no he didn't, and that makes me sad. However, he did play Augustus in Demon Bane, which is something. But the other gag-based work that's on, that's on the screen here that is a case of no matter how many times I watch it, I still don't know what how, what I feel about it, and I think <laughs> and. This was a show that when Shades was doing his episode by episode format of his old show, he had to he had to drop it because because there wasn't much that he could really say. And that is ah, Pop yes. Team Epic. Pop oh, Team the, Epic. The struggle is real. Yeah. Now, to be clear to everyone, I didn't drop the show cuz it was bad. I didn't I I didn't hate the show. In fact, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The problem was is that there was nothing to discuss. It was literally starting to come down to me just talking about, you know, I'd have to spoil all the good gags and then just talk about the, the, the running theme of each time, each episode was the same set of skits played twice over with just changing out the voice cast. One time, one time it would be uh, the two girls that would be played by female VAs, and then the second time they'd be played by mostly male VAs. Mm -hmm. Like, that was literally it. So I was like, well, what's the point of recapping this if that's all I'm doing? Yeah. And the big reason that I, the big reason that I say that is I describe Pop Team Epic as drugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yes indeed. Pop Team Epic he is what happens when Tim and Eric or Eric Andre get a hold of uh, get a hold of their own cartoon. Mm -hmm. It really is. Like it is pure like it is pure distilled random in anime form. Like there's, to, to, there is technically a structure to a lot of the skits, but there's really not much there in terms of structure. It is mainly just like the skits are just there to set up whatever jokes they want to tell for that skit. So. It walks that very fine line. Like each skit within each skit, the jokes they tell fit, and there's a structure to the skit itself. But you don't really even sense a plot until like near the very end. And even then, it really just feels like they decided, oh, we just need to have a big finale for the sake of a big finale. So fuck it. <laughs> yeah, but th I think the reason why Pop Team Epic is able to get away with it is because is um. Because even even though even though it is very much um, a collection of a collection of skits, I would com I would compare it to SNL, but it but it's actually entertaining, unlike SNL these days. Oh, oh. But it's the, it's the fact that you have absolute when you're watching it for the first time, you have absolutely no idea what you're getting into because. Every single sketch, there's no, there's nothing that could be considered safe. Sometimes it might, sometimes it might be animation. Sometimes it might be stop motion. Sometimes it might be pixel art. Sometimes it might, sometimes it might be um, full on CG. You have no clue what you're getting into between scenes. This isn't or hell, they might this... even just do stuff in fucking MS Paint. Mm -hmm. This isn't deconstruction. This is destruction. This yes. is complete yeah. and total demolition of what an, of what an animation made it series kit is or whatever. The only <laughs> yeah. structure is the opening is the OP. The OP and the two main characters, Popico and Pe 
peep your bean. Mm-hmm. That's it. You these two oddly shaped girls in every skit, and that is literally it. You would think that you'd have um one per one person as the fun one person as the funny woman, the other as the and the other as the um straight one. But you don't. But that doesn't even apply either because sometimes the jo- the jokes aren't about the environment, but at each other. Like say, the prison interrogation. <laughs> no, the prison the prison initiation mm-hmm. where she goes to break uh, Popico breaks peeping me out, and they initiate her into some kind of gang through though instead of doing something violent or whatever that most gangs do, they suck on a lemon. Mm-hmm. Or they know they lick a lemon. Yeah. And of course, there, of course, there's the ge- there there was there was the ge- there was the gag regarding the um I was referring to the prison interrogation where this like do you have any idea what you did now here's here's this cutlet eat it <laughs> oh that's right <laughs> the fucking cutlet yeah and of course you of course. Midway, of course, every, of course, every episode is split into two. Where mid, where midway through, they do the exact same skits, just completely replace the voice actors, and, and even- not <laughs> entirely the same. No. They actually do very. They do actually create some minor variations. It's the same setup and the same, and often the same punchline. But in between, there's differences. So you can't even just say, "Oh, I've already seen this. I've already seen the half of this." The first half and the second half to be the same. No, there's little things that you have to look out for in the second half that you're like, wait, that that's different. <laughs> that that didn't happen the first time. And there's also the fact that they're not exactly cons- there's not ex- you can't you can't even say that you're safe regarding the voice cast because it's not like they have one pa- one male pair and one female pair. No, they switch. No, they switch voice actors out every episode. Yeah, they're the only time that the voice cast was consistent was with those aforementioned MS Paint design sketches where they kept the exact same cast. In the dub, it was I believe it was Chris Sabat and who was the other? I, you know, I gotta look this up now. Mm-hmm. I just they, like they to point this... out that PPME was voiced by Norio Wakamoto in episode 3. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. Also, I did some digging. At, uh, Norio Wakamoto was chaos. I was wrong. <laughs> okay, okay then. Okay then. Uh, Which is probably why he never fits in anywhere. He's chaos. Is that why? Is that why Jack? Is that why Jack keeps chasing him? Who knows. <laughs> I mean, like, nobody nobody seems to realize that Norio Wakamoto is also an ordinary Johnny Johnny. Hello, Guilty Gear references. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was the Bob Team epic skits that had. Uh, it was Chris Sabat and Ian Sinclair. Mm-hmm. God well, damn it, Ian! <laughs> I was just about to do that. <laughs> Beat you to it. <laughs> I will make that into a T-shirt one of these days. I swear. But yeah, aside from those skits, every every episode, you had four different VAs. Two playing Popico, two playing Peepamy, and you had to... And, and it, it, it for us, it also became a guessing game. It was like, okay, who's playing them this time? Yeah. I think... I think and I remember when we were watching it when it, during its run on Toonami, we ended up going through the... We ended up going through the wiki to see, okay, who do we got this week? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it. it was, and there were a lot of big names. Like they pulled out for Funimation's dub, they pulled out like all of their top guys. I mentioned Chris Sabat, uh, Ian Sinclair, Justin Brainer, Trina Nishimura, Sunny Strait, Sarah Wiedenheff, Jade Saxton, Jeremy Lee, Eric Vale, Brittany Karbowski, <laughs> fucking Jamie Markey, Monica Rial, J. Michael Tatum. Like you, you name. A, a well-known VA in the anime industry, they were probably in a part of this dub. And um, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. I'd pay good. I pay um, that. I would pay good money to be a fly on the wall when th- when this got pitched. <laughs> right. 
Holy shit. So it's a show that you're going to have to hire different voice actors for every episode. Mm. Funimation looks at them and goes, the fuck are you smoking? And uh. the, th but the key thing, the, again, the key thing with the, to to um summarize this whole diatribe is with pop team epic there is so, the it is so unpredictable in terms of what you are going to get with it with its gags that you can't that you can't feel safe but the but there's so much of a car crash you can't look away yeah the the thing of it is is that like when you look at something like pop team epic it is just like I said, pure distilled randomness. Though within the skits, there is structure there. Like the jokes they tell within the skits make sense within that skit. Comparing that to Bobo, Bo, where it has the illusion of structure, but it doesn't actually have a structure. Mm -hmm. Each episode is just pure insanity disguised under a plot. Mm -hmm. And. There's a few others that there's a few others that go into the weird end of things that I do want to bring up, and it's f for that reason. Before we went live, I was laughing my ass off because of one name that got brought up, Masakas. Um, and I that name even is, get it right. Yeah, Masaki Yuasa. Masaki Yuasa. Yuasa. So, sorry, my head's in like three different places. Um, who? Yuasa, I, I find it, I find him to be the strongest argument against drug use, <laughs> <laughs> especially in his early years. Oh yes, his in his later years he has me he has mellowed out somewhat, but I blame that solely on the fact that in more recent years he has been adapting other people's work. Yeah, stuff like Devilman Crybaby and what is considered probably one of the best anime, I believe it was 2019, mm -hmm. in Keep Your Hands Off Azekent. Yeah. Hey, hey. And we com contrast that with his early work, especially his first work, Mind Game, which a few years ago was used for an April Fool's joke on Toonami, to the point where they decided to use the... You, um, use Japanese voice actors for the U for the North American airing of Toonami that week. Even down to the Tom segments, yes, mm -hmm. even Tom was uh, was was uh, dubbed in Japanese that night. Mm -hmm. It was fucking hilarious. And they called back to it a few times afterwards with a with the vibe of, I have no idea what happened that week. <laughs> But cocaine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> but mind game is apparently apparently the whole thing started as a dare as far as how far he could push something be considered animation. Aha. Uh -huh. Which not not surprisingly, he could push the boundaries pretty fucking far. One of the more normal things that happens in that in that movie is the main character outrunning God. Yes, one of the more normal things. That's what you heard, people. <laughs> <laughs> just take take the, take a minute to process what that what, what that statement just said. Mm -hmm. And he would only get weirder with his with his subsequent stuff. Although, for our purposes, Kaiba doesn't quite qualify, even though it's even though its visuals are certainly on the weird end of things, like a weeb Doctor Seuss. Yes, mm -hmm. very, very, very good description there. Mm -hmm. I would like to point out that Mind Game is also him adapting someone else's work. Ah. It's an adaptation of the Mind Game manga by Robin Nishi. Okay, that I was that we, I was not made aware of. We stand corrected. Mm -hmm. Well, it's... I mean, it's as far as you can say that a film is an adaptation of a manga run... It's mostly inspired by, I guess is the better word. So we're dealing with the age-old chestnut of based on a true story. Age-old chestnut of based on a true story or anything of that nature, yeah. But it's still 
it has a basis in something else. That's what yeah. I'm trying to say. But with uh, with something like Tatami Galaxy, that was where he started to mellow out because that was a much more st straight-ish adaptation of something. Hi. But even ca even calling that mellowing out is a bit is a bit of a stretch. Also, also having a voice actor who may have done work as an auctioneer, I can't tell. <laughs> Which one are we talking about now here? Oh. I mean, Galaxy. Lots of shit. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I'm talking about the main the main character. Yeah. Shin yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of shit. Yeah. Who? He um, he's a bit of a fast talker. Is all I'm saying. He slows down mm -hmm. later on this later on in the series, but he talked ridiculously fast. I mean, the same guy played parody Goku in Gintama. Huh. Fair point. But with even even within the even within those, for as absurd as the as abs, as he got, and as as much of a as much of a drug high as he may have been on, a lot of the absurdness with his with his stuff, I'd say, has more to do with his visuals than with his writing. Yeah, like when you break down the, a lot of the writing of his shows, they tend you you can you can find a pretty sensible structure. It's just that the visual end of things are so ridiculous and over the top that sometimes it can be hard to process that. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that he's that he's dialed back on. I'd say I'd say the for, I'd, and even even. Even in the stuff that he's dialed back with, like De as Devil Man Crybaby still had its fair share of absurdness with its visuals. Oh yeah, though it just dawned on me, Monk. There is another series we forgot to bring up when it came to shows that had randomness with some structure. Go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have two words for you. Repent, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> How can the how the fuck can we forget panty and stocking? Yeah, <sighs> AKA, that AKA the AKA the last troll move of Gynax. <laughs> Remember, <clears throat> everyone should know right now that the that panty and stocking with garter belt, garter belt, the idea for written for that was written on a fucking napkin <laughs> when a bunch of Gynax guys were out having lunch at a at a bar. That's it. Well, it is Gynax. Are we really that surprised? I thought the legend was uh, after. I thought the legend was after Gurren Logan, the staff went on like a winter, like uh, winter uh, company trip or whatever, like that. They all got drunk and binged, uh, drawn drawn together in other Western anime shows, and that and that's how they came up with the idea. There that's are the as there are as many legends as there as there are Gynax people um, involved with. Panty and stocking. I doubt we'll ever actually know the real, the real story. Truth. The real truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 sometimes the, the myth is better than reality. Yeah, though. Even on even on the show's Wikipedia page, JT story tends to hold up. Quote from Wikipedia: Following the broadcast of Imaishi's previous project, Girl in the Gun, the show staff went on a trip for rest and relaxation. At that time, they aired their opinions to each other under uh. uh under under drunken and humorous circumstances, saying such things as "Next time I want to try this" and approach this animation. Almost all of the concepts for the anime were made during their initial trip. The names of the characters, Panty and Stocking, were coined at the first meeting. Hiromi uh, Wakaya Wakabayashi, who provided the initial idea for the series, cited American and adult animation such as Drawn Together as inspiration for the show's crudeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like like I said, there are as many legends as there are people involved. I doubt we'll ever know the actual truth. Hi. <laughs> yeah, they're not exactly going to tell us because they what they enjoy us trying to speculate. Oh, I for in for whatever reason, I'm reminded of how everybody and their mother in the German film industry tried to claim that they had some involvement with the captain with the cabinet of Doctor Caligari. mm Hmm. Um, and as I've mentioned elsewhere, the most ridiculous uh, claim was by Fritz Lang, who claimed that he came up with the framing device. 
a claim that nobody buys because the timeline doesn't add up, and why would you take credit for that? I don't know. He just wanted to be involved. It's like it's like saying that you would it's like saying that you were a writer on Sonic 06. Ah, uh, yes. The story about saving the world and bestiality. But it's funny that it's funny that Panty and Stocking gets is brought up in that because I'd say that I'd say that is a case of of a proper use of parody. Cuz yeah, it it has a general structure, a general premise that it sticks to throughout the entire thing, but within each episode Shit just goes crazy. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I don't think it reaches the same level of absurdity as what we've been looking for in absurd things, though. No, uh, but not, it does have quite. enough of it to count. I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd say that. I'd say there's enough for me to. I'd say there's enough for me to say that th that it's that it's not that that it, that I can't call it not absurd. <laughs> I mean, it's absurd for different reasons, mm -hmm. like the fact that uh. Well, let's just remember that he's a shotgun, with, but he's a two-pump chump. Oh, <laughs> oh. and of course, but um, it's kind it's kind of hard for me to. It would be kind of hard for me to write off um, panty and stocking with garter belt when it comes to discussions of absurdity. Given one particular episode, you know the one. <laughs> You're gonna have to give it to the to the audience, monk. The Transformer episode. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah, just talk about, or, or 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 maybe we can talk about the fact that they set up sequel sequel baiting that they knew they were never going to get to make. Oh, uh, oh that still pisses me off. You know, which was, they did. which was the entire joke. Yeah, they basically were poking fun at the Gynex problem. Although, uh, for the initiated who want to hunt it down, there is actually a picture, uh, there is actually an illustration collection drawn by Imaishi of a, t of a epilogue episode that follows the finale of Panny and Stocking, mm -hmm. which actually even has a, cr even has some crossover with the rest of the later to, uh, the, the late now coined trigger, trigger verse. Of the Trigger Trigger Anime Studios, mm -hmm. so Sounds... hunt that down. I, I I don't know how else to describe it, but hunt that down if you can find it. Especially since Studio Trigger basically became the reincarnation of Gainax. Since in the years since, Gainax has been dealing with a um, spot of bother, to say the least. A few spots of bother, and the only person they used to be able to rely on was Ano, and then Ano left and created Studio Kara. And I think. I think the I think the house is uh, the house has been abandoned. I'd say I'd say I'd say after the league after the um, legal trouble and I th I think em I think embezzlement was one of the, was one of the accusations in the process that in a casting couch. Um, nobody wants a, nobody wants to work in a media circus. Yep. And well, in the case of in the case of Anno, he seems. He seems far more interested in in the in um, his tokusatsu work these days instead of animation. Good for him. Uh, he uh, well, I mean, he he did finally finish the story he's been wanting to tell for forever. I mean, there, there's that, and lately he's been doing those Shin projects. Mm-hmm. Shin Godzilla, back in 2015. Shin Godzilla was the first one. Um. May have been for the best that he decided to not stick around at Toho. Um, Shin Ultraman, I think, is still in the works, as well as Shin Kamen Rider, which, as a fan of Kamen Rider, that name is still going to throw me the fuck off. I know why it's named that way, but s still. <laughs> Zan, Shades, you know exactly why. Yep. <laughs> Getting back, getting back onto the rails with some, with something like Panty and Stocking, the you have you definitely have that structure of who of who our titular characters are supposed to be. You have a straight man. You have you have two people who could be considered the straight man. Um, garter belt to a point, 
and our and our and our um fav and our favorite kid who you, whose eyes you never see because he is trying because he is trying to be a visual novel protagonist. Mm-hmm. Mm. Got a little brief. Mm-hmm. Brief, I would hey, say, is the closest thing to a straight man in this. Well, easily. if you if you count characters outside of Panty and Stalking, if 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 it's just Panty and Stalking, the straight woman is definitely Stalking. Yeah, I would. I was gonna say I was gonna say the straight man was Garter Belt, but no, not mm -mm. quite. Not with his penchant for DB for BDSM. No. Boy. But even even with all of these, the key thing there's a few key things that can most definitely be said. One of them is is um having a structure and sticking to it, or go if you're gonna go random, don't half ass it. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice that with with several of these, they're they are trying to parody uh, parody elements of other works. Which is par for the course when dealing with comedy. But I want to use this to talk about one particular attempt at parody that didn't stick the landing for me. I am kind of cheating by bringing up a Western work, but we're not exclusively focused on anime for this. We might be weebs, but we're not that weeb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to just—I'd like to bring up Perfect Hair Forever, that one shot sketch that William Street did back in the mid 2000s. Now, to its credit, we got a bitchin' ass song from MF Doom from it as part of the Danger Doom album, which more people need to listen to. Yes, fucking yes. Which as an as an aside, you have no idea how happy I was when I found out that Psyche Origami and Collective Efforts are doing new albums. Sweet. Oh. Uh, for those who don't know them, you probably heard you probably heard at least one of their tracks j just from a just um in terms of background beats because William Street loved working with a lot of the um, Atlanta underground scene. Mm. But but with Perfect Hair Forever, it felt like trying to do a parody. It was trying to do a parody of anime, and I think the reason it didn't stick is for the same reason you can't do a parody of, say, animation. This is a pet peeve of mine, but it drives me up a fucking wall whenever people refer to animation or anime as a genre. It is a medium. There are way there is way too much even even if we were to go to go back to go back in time 30 years ago, there would be way too many genres and subgenres to classify anime as a genre. Yeah. I only really let that slide when I was growing up because there was so, because there were so few things coming stateside that you could kind of get away with it in a video store. Yeah, but like if you look at all the other examples we've brought up so far, even Bobo Bo, as much as I hate it, Defined itself down to a g particular genre of anime parody. It was parodying classic shonen anime like Fist of the North Star. You know, that made why it was at least slightly, and I very, very stressfully say slightly better. <laughs> mm -hmm. And with all the with all the other ones, Gintama is, par is parodying the long-running... Um, shown in works that we got that we got in the two thousands, um, Nadesco isn't exactly a parody, but it is it is ta it is um, making fun of of the trend of, of the trend divide with um, Mecha, the divide between Super Robot and Real Robot. Um, Excel Excel Saga is is making fun of the whole evil organization tr uh, motif. It was basically Sentai in all but name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really was. Just I'd from the side of the villains. I just realized that it could probably be considered a precursor to the kind of antics that Garage Pro gets up to. Eh. Uh, who, 
I will note Garage Pro ended up causing me to go down a rabbit hole of independent Tokusats. And the whole local hero thing. Mm hmm Which... Have fun going down that rabbit hole, especially since apparently one of the people who's involved with with those with those sort of costume making follows me. Don't know why. But in but even but within all of them there there's something specific that is focused on and I think the reason Perfect Hair Forever didn't stick with me was that not only is not only is trying to parody the majority of anime in 2003 a bit of a stretch because this was when the content was really starting to explode but also it felt the targets that it was parodying felt like the kind of targets that you would that you would see in the 90s when people were just starting to get into this whole anime thing I mean, par parodying Gundam, Sailor Moon and DBZ you want a cookie? <laughs> if you did, if you did that in 1997, I'd be I'd be a little more willing to go with it, but not in 2003. I mean, it's there's a there's a reason why I get why I give such disrespect to people who who watch a few episodes of say Demon Slayer or Attack on Titan and think that they can make some hot take about about all of anime. Which is a which is a roundabout way for me to say fuck the Anna tweeters. Uh, and cer and that, certain voice actors who th who think that they know better. Roundabout way. <laughs> mm -hmm. But with but within d within doing absurdity, I think a common trap that ends up happening is a lot of people think that if you just throw randomness into things then you then you can call yourself an absurdist comedy if you try and do that you end up becoming 12 ounce mouse don't be 12 ounce mouse no, no please please don't please don't i hesitate to even call that shit animation or do be 12 ounce mouse and also a failure boy I'm pretty sure a lot of people e who even grew up around that time have forgotten 12 ounce mouse and the idea the idea the idea of of, tr of trying to make fun of certain animation I mean you can you can certainly you can certainly do that but you actually have to have have um have one have some degree of appeal you know one of the seven principles of animation I think that I think that's another thing that Bo that something like Bobo Bo could could be seen as failing at. Yeah, one of the things I complained about with Bobo Bo was that in their attempts at their parody, they tr they used every animation shortcut in the fucking book. We're talking still shots during action scenes, speed lines, or just having like them trying to act like they're moving when they just have a random background. Reused footage, like we mentioned earlier, just every shortcut they can think of, just so and, and thinking they could get away with it by saying, "Oh, well, that's just part of the parody." No, that's not how it works. If you're doing all of that, then you're just another generic shown in anime, and uh, not a very good one. Yeah, um, I tell a partial lie. It's not seven principles; it's twelve principles. Um. It's based. It's based on a. It's based on a book called *The Illusion of Life* by um, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who were animators in Disney back in the back in the seventies and and onwards. Um, and is ba is based on a lot of the a lot of the work that Disney did in the in the nineteen thirties. The principles are squash and stretch, anticipation, staging, straight ahead action, and pose to pose. Um, follow through and overlapping action, slow in and slow out, arc, secondary action, timing, exaggeration, solid drawing, and appeal. I would say of these, they were, would it be fair of me to say that Bobo Bo relied a bit on the on um exa on exaggeration, but not as not as much on um, solid drawing or appeal. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there was a lot of times where the art quality would in be intentionally just at its worst. And yeah, the appeal was just not there. And now, to be fair, other sh other some of the other shows you mentioned, ex especially Excel Saga, also dipped into some of these things. But they used them sparingly enough that it legitimately did feel like they were just making fun of those things. In fact, a couple of, couple of those shows legitimately called that shit out. Mm -hmm. It's just that Bobo Bo used them so frequently, they were no longer parody. They were just being used to say for the sake of using them. Mm -hmm. And to uh, circle around to more <clears throat> the animation shortcuts and other uh, shortcuts that you've been mentioning... Uh, I'd actually like to circle back to Trigger, because Trigger um, famously, early on, has ha <clears throat> had a shoestring budget making their earliest works. And they had to they had to use a lot of animation shortcuts. But if we go to pop the the show that likely popularized Trigger as a household name, Kill the Kill, Every time they did use an animation shortcut, they incorporated it into a gag. Yeah. Remember remember the cutout of Mako that Ryoko is carrying around in episode two? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, but the cutout blinks and reacts to things. She just doesn't, her outline doesn't move because they couldn't afford to animate it. So it's an animation gag. When she carries her around like a cardboard cutout and then pushes her out of frame with the scissor blade like she's an object. Yeah, there there you can tell that it is part of the gag. Even though they had to use it because, well, again, shoestring budget. They found a way to work around that to make something funny instead of just, oh, we're just going to use it and people will just assume it's part of the joke. Yep. They, they also were using some... Uh, <clears throat> of the tropes and shortcuts of the magical girl genre, considering what Kill a Kill is, such as transformation stock footage. Mm. But they would sometimes humorously speed it up to like three or four times speed, just because it was like near the end of the episode and, and Ryuko was actually in a hurry for something. And so they're like, let's just do this, go, 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 blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, oh, hey, they would it's... have dialogue over it so that there's still something happening and not just the freaking transformation sequence. Mm. Yep, it 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 reminds me of the uh, of the time Domon defeats the dock workers by putting out his toe to tri to trip them with their jet stream attack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but even even though Kill a Kill is not a parody, Kill a Kill is a is the idea of fashion and fascism being the same word or near near as such in Japanese. Uh. Yeah. Um, the, these people from Trigger, who have had lots of experience, even going so far back as, as Gainax, of not just doing serious stuff, but doing comedy, was to their advantage, and while not absurdist, was still effective. I, which I would, I would not consider... Have. I, would consider kill a, I would say Kill a Kill was more satirical than anything. It, it was definitely some somewhat satire of certain genre tropes, like the fact that neither of these magical girls is cutesy. Yeah, they're magical girls. Make no fucking mistake; those no. are magical fucking girls. And no, yeah, any no argument. Who, <laughs> yeah, any of you trope. fuckers out there who want to try and argue with me on this, fuck you, fight me. <laughs> um, and he won't be alone because I agree with him. Yeah, it like it hits every trope of a magical girl series. It, it, it just makes fun of those tropes, or at least po it pokes fun of those tropes through satirical means, but they are fucking magical girls in every sense of the term. Gentlemen, we are missing the more obvious trigger, uh, more obvious target of trigger property uh, as far as absurd, as far as absurd as a... Inferno Cop? Comedy goes. Inferno Cop! <laughs> <laughs> Which Inferno barely Cop had any animation. Barely and... had any animation. It was like cutouts in Flash. Mm-hmm. Inferno Cop is the Japanese version of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. That is it why. Really is. I, Inferno I, I, Cop really is. Good. I was gonna say Inferno Cop is just. Uh, it's just Axe Cop, except the Japanese version. It's just Axe Cop, except the Japanese version. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Which makes me think that there was a missed opportunity to when it comes to doing a crossover between Infernal Cop and Samurai Cop. I mean, they should do a crossover between Inferno Cop and uh, and the Quad S universe, but that's only because uh, Alexis Carib looks a lot like Inferno Cop's uh, um um boss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolute Justice, I think his name was. Yeah. Space yeah. Patrol Luluco. Hmm. Space Patrol. Space Patrol Luluco, the space show that's ironically not in space most of the time. Although speaking yeah. of space and speaking of absurdity. How could I not? How could I not talk? Of, how could we not talk about the one, spa- the one space opera like show that under that understands that the answer is always booty. Nah! Oh. Hey, Standy. Yeah. Hey. Hey. That's that's the dandy way, baby. <laughs> Hell yeah. <sighs> also, once again, goddamn it, Ian. Mm-hmm. Boy. <laughs> I swear, Some I swear to God. Work, I'd say. <laughs> I swear to, I swear to God, that guy is stalking us. Uh, to be fair, to be fair, that huh? show was made for Ian Sinclair. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> that has a. to be some of his best work right there. Fucking a man, born, born to play, born to play it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And. When it came to when it came when it comes to de- when it comes to that particular show, the major much like with Cowboy Bebop to an extent, um, which space deity is clearly aping in some respects. Well, same well, it's made by the same guy, so uh, yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> right. I'm it's just saying that it's 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 one work drawing inspiration from the other. Yeah, but. It is. It is very much situational. You ver. You ver. You. You have instead of a lot. Instead of a lot of little gags, you have one long gag. You through through throughout a given story. Um, a, a given episode. S- some re- some recurring characters, obviously, but there. But um, as things go on, things get a little bit more and more insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the episode where they all got turned into zombies and yet somehow are fine by the next episode. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> keeping that in mind, <clears throat> and the reason I, I say keeping that in mind, that actually uh, brought me. Oh, what was I thinking of? Oh man, I never. I lost it. Never mind. Oh. It happens. Farewell. It did, no, no, I got it back now. I did get it back now. Okay. Another Western animation that went for absurdism that apparently a lot of people like, but never hit for me, um, and I think fails for a lot of the same reasons these other shows we've talked about have failed, Bojack Horseman. Ooh. Oh, yeah. One of my, one of my absolute favorites. I, it, I, I feel that it fails for a lot of things because... <sighs> No, there's no. The no, Bulljack Horseman is not absurdism. It's an absurd world, to be sure, with the with the uh, juxtaposition of animal and animal and human characters. But it's very much a world that exists on its own set of rules and engagement rules and engagement. Yeah, and then then operates under very 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 sometimes almost crushingly grounded reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and for me that uh. It also doesn't help that the straight man is supposed to be Bojack, and quite often, because it is because of some of the stuff is kind of crap sack world syndrome. There, oh, yeah. It's it's not that there's a straight man and a funny man. It's just that everybody's goddamn depressed. Yes, I I, I it it it. Everybody's it had, their own straight man. Yeah, which it does not work for something that's trying to be a comedy. Hmm. And that's why it really didn't hit with me. Uh, and like you said, it, it's not really... It, it isn't absurdism because it isn't taking what is known and taking it to an absurd extreme. It's its own world with its own ideals. And it has an absurd premise. But I just... But, I, I never could get into it. Mm-hmm. Fine enough. I can... I, I, li- I liked BoJack Horseman, but I will not deny that BoJack Horseman had a rough start. Uh, 
Now, when it comes to the when it comes to uh, when it comes to that level of that level of absurdity, I think an, I think some I think something else to to keep in mind is you can't really uh, you the whole absurd the whole absurd of look at how crazy this is. That's the kind of thing that has a very short shelf life, unless yeah. you vary it up. Yeah, which actually leads me to another series that we almost forgot to talk about because we, we we brought this up quite a few times leading up to this episode that worked best because it kept itself short, simp, sweet, and to the point. Booty Cooley. Hmm. Of course. Of course. <sighs> you see, there's a, there's a, there's a, that's a, that's an interesting and complicated one to bring up. Because yes, yes. It, much like much like the Akira manga um Furikuri actually has a manga now and that manga is way different from the show which I don't understand why mm. um but technically the show came after the manga was created, and the 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 only like connection between them is is some of the gags and of course the some of the general initial plot structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it fits a lot of the bills that we a lot of the checks we've been making here. It has a general structure. It has a. It actually is one of the few that actually does have a method to a lot of its madness. But the madness is so absurd, it's kind of hard sometimes to see through it. Like, I remember the first time trying to watch Fully Cooley, I could not make heads or tails of over what the fuck I was watching. Uh, it was only as I got older and understood more that a lot of the jokes started to make sense. Late nights, so late, late weekday nights on adults, on adults, first generation adult swim. Those were good yeah. times to be alive. I, <laughs> I, um, I actually got cootie cootie on a level because of the themes in it resonating with stuff happening in my life like you watch not, as, sorry go ahead start go ahead, go ahead. It, 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 it obviously not the exact same events because those events are literally impossible but uh the idea of growing up because that's what the whole show is about mm -hmm. yeah um so a lot of I got a lot of the jokes because they were related to growing up, uh, and a lot of the themes, and of course that's why I had crushing depression at the end of that episode, at the end of the last episode, and be began writing a a fan fiction that will never see the light of day. Fuck all of you. <laughs> <laughs> that, in fact, I don't think that 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 um yeah, I'm pretty sure that. That fan fiction died on one of my older hard drives, so it doesn't uh, exist feeling. anymore. Fuck y'all. A feeling I know all too well. <laughs> but uh, th the thing I don't like about Fooly Cooly is everything uh, happening in modern day with it. Oh my! Yeah, yeah this is a Mark good. Mark even said the same thing. <laughs> this is no, progressive. Good a, this is a good a time as any to talk about progressive and alternative, which. I think it, and I grunge think and shoegaze coming out next year. Yeah, we got two more coming. Grunge, uh, grunge, I believe. Grunge and shoegaze. That's a grunge. I, lo I, I love how they're naming them after different genres of music. I, I, I that's the only thing I like about this is that I, that it you know is uh, in, it keeps with the music vibe. But uh, I didn't know, didn't know when to stop. Didn't didn't know when to stop. Yada yada it is a Foodie Cootie <laughs> as a as a uh, as itself all the way back in two thousand. AKA classic dad rock classic dad rock, uh Foodie Cootie. <laughs> if you want it's, to put a musical genre to it. It had a it had a, it, it had its presence, it had its gags, it had all of its punch points. And all of those punch points hit really well for people 
in in adolescence it's it, it is those constant one two ko's coming at you in every part of your life during adolescence and the and the 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 show emulates that the connectivity is is there loosely but it's mostly there about being along for the ride of your own adolescence because you just you can't control it so you just have to deal hi, hi. the whole first six episodes the only six episodes just like there are only 25 episodes of death note fuck you <laughs> <laughs> um the the whole thing it encapsulates that wild ride and coming to terms with it. The embarrassment, the hurt, the isolation, all of it. And for me, that's why it was ultimately so cathartic as a show. Um, it didn't need any sort of sequel. No, but of course no. the show no, was a cult classic that everyone beloved, and of course the studio sees dollar signs and has to follow suit, because the only reason, the only thing that makes progressive and alternative part of Fully Cooly is that Haruka is involved. Uh. <sighs> because none of the cast from the original ever came back. It's just Haruka and... A lot of the other elements there when guarding it. And even then, well, a lot of those the, were kind of twisted around. Well, well, the problem is that uh, Fully Cooley is kind of... go is kind of. Uh, I think I've figured it out. It, it's it's uh, falling prey to what I call Jack Sparrow Syndrome, where um, you have an original movie, which was great, where, where you had a side character, where you had a side character, which was deeply, deeply beloved and an absolute smash hit, which kind of overclips the over over eclipsed the the uh, the work as a whole, and then any, everything, and then they decided to subsequently make more about that, making the side character the main the main attraction of the of the of the franchise, and that is not a good point because it loses the point of how effective they were as a side character in the first place towards the to the real main character, which was Nauta in the original, Nauta and his uh, growth into adolescence and growth into adolescence uh, in, the ori in the original. So, it's Jack Sparrow syndrome is what this is. The side character taking on, uh, becoming the head of, the fran of a franchise that was not you know, it, that was never the original intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that's a good that's a good way to look at it. And the funny thing is, if you look back at if you look back at, um at Haruko in the original Fuli Cooley, you could argue she's the villain. He is she's, the villain. <laughs> she's certainly she's the it. antagonist, that's for she's sure. That. Absolutely. And, and the weird part is, is they kept trying to do that. They kept trying to make her the villain in some subsequent series. Like, you look at Progressive especially, she is not, not a good person. And yet she's the protagonist. She's the focus. Yeah, Which is because... Not she is no. the one everyone loves. Everyone, she, like she was supposed to represent that resistance to growing up, mm -hmm. someone who just wants to have fun, be wild, go nuts. Peter Pan. Yeah, yeah. There you go. She well, was fucking Peter Pan. And you can see the difference in how uh, Naota um, overcame his his reluctances of coming of age. Compared to Amarau, the man who wears the big eyebrows in order to seem more manly because of Haruko. Amarau did not grow up. He, se he seems like he has. He's an adult now. He's, you know, a commander for the, the Galactic Space Police Brotherhood. He, or the Interstellar Immigration Bureau, excuse me. Um, he He has all of these responsibilities and a uh and in a subordinate who helps him his subordinate is more competent than he is vastly more competent than he is let's yeah. also he the other, of course the other problem they have with with is the fact that 
For all intents and purposes, in the broad strokes, progressive and alternative are trying to do the exact are trying to do the exact same coming of not only coming of age story, but also Haruko's endless pursuit of Atomisk. Oh, yeah. The pi- the pirate king. The man who can steal anything with his eno channels that are so big. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, they're treading the same story, and I feel that uh, grunge and shoegaze are going to do the same thing. Um, Almost a guarantee, because that's what worked. It's what worked with the original. Each time they reiterate, it's a copy of a copy. Everybody, have you? do you ever remember back in the days when you'd copy a JPEG to another place and then copy it again and copy it again? Eventually, how the JPEG would become unrecognizable, a blur... Mm-hmm. A gray splotch. That's what's happening here. And with that, with, with all of that in mind, coming back to the absurdity, the absurdity worked in the first season because of the type of story it was telling. Because you needed that chaos to feel that ride that is a coming of age. Especially one as chaotic as Nauta's. Um, and it's it's very clear that he grew up before Haruko did, because he's the one who you know he he, he actually embodies Atomisk in the last episode. He becomes the the avatar of Atomisk, and instead of giving it to Haruko to seek her approval, he lets Atomisk go. To tell her that he loves her. Which is, it's very clear that she's both unable to properly process, doesn't understand, you know, what he means by it, and at the same time, slightly unnerved by his change. Mm -hmm. He grew up, Amarao did not. And you can, you can compare the two to see how Naota grew up. And, what where the absurdism mixes in with this is of course a lot of the subject matter and a lot of the visuals in, up in, up and up into and including uh the whole things coming out of his head or what the what was what the hell was the deal with those um headphones in, in the in that in um i think that was in alternative no for yeah i believe so yeah which if I'm being honest, Alternative was the weaker of the two, if, on- if only because of the fact that it didn't have a good protagonist, whereas the other one, which had a wor- which oddly enough had a worse ending, <laughs> at least had a cast of characters that you could build around. In a very yeah, it was a very Breakfast Club kind of cast. And at no, the you, very you, least, you, you got no, you got it mixed up. Progressive is the one with the headphones and the one with the bad ending. Uh, alternative is the one you're talking about now. Yeah, alternative. Alter- alternative could have been re. Alternative and many people have agreed on this. Could easily have been retooled into its own series. I mean, you could you could keep the character that Haruko plays in Alternative, just not make her Haruko, just make her as a you know, mysterious uh, genie in a bottle, genie in a bottle character that just helps the protagonist uh, come to a conclu- come to you know their growth and conclusion. Uh, alternative had in its but in its DNA something of sub- su- something of substance that could stand on its own, but it's still being weighed down by the fact that it's a fully cooly property. Yeah, and. This it I'd say Fully Cooly is a is a case where the randomness ends up being its own worst enemy because so much because so many people focused on that instead of it being a story about growing up. It, they're they're missing the point. They're they're, yeah. it's, they're they're missing the point. They're 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 latching onto the sizzle and not the steak. And that's the yeah. problem. It's it's forced for the trees. Like like I said, the ultimate reason the absurdity worked is they were part of the vehicle to tell the chaos of adolescence. Yeah. Hey, they, were, hey. they were part of what was used to punctuate and accentuate the things about 
actually growing up as a teenager, as a preteen and a teenager, the things that are happening that you just don't fucking understand. There's no fucking way to understand them at the beginning of that ride. And and overcoming them is all part of adolescence, learning to cope and overcome with those things. Because of that, the the absurdity worked. But now if you're trying to tell the same story again and again with the subsequent series, the absurdity is going to become the rote. It's going to become the expected in the end. And that's never good. No. I know we kind of waxed a little bit on Foodie Cootie there. Yeah. <laughs> But that's because Fully Cooley is is something that is going to come going to come up when it comes to that that sort of absurdity. And if there's it, if I will if I will give one nice thing to progressive and alternative, it was great. It's always great to hear more music from the Pillows. Hi, hi. <laughs> oh, had had good ed had good eds on both of those. And spiky oh, yeah. seed spiky seeds and. Uh... Shining Overdrive or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Star Overdrive. Yeah. And I would, I could bring up how a, how a lot of early Japanese rock is not too far removed from surf rock, but that's a story for another night. I think when it comes to do, when it comes to doing absurd, we've set. I think we've established a few ground rules that need to be followed. Oh, and these are not these are not ground rules in terms of this is the this is the gospel according to the Geek Watch or something like that, but more of things to keep in mind based on what what um decision that you go down. First is that if you're if is that if you're going to be doing a parody, you have to be parodying something specific, and you have to stick to that parody. Do not do not pull a do not try and pull a genre shift a little ways into a little ways into your show. It's not going to work. The second thing the second thing I think I think that we've established is you need to make sure that you have a found that you either have a foundation, and if you choose to not have a foundation, you need to go balls fucking out in terms of your randomness and make literally everything random or or at least the potential for randomness the third thing is that ra is that randomness ra throwing in randomness is not going to equal comedy and la and lastly make sure not make sure not to overindulge in it other otherwise Otherwise, that's going to end up being the focus instead of the instead of the story you want to tell. If there's a story you want to tell within your absurd comedy, be sure be sure to tell it, but make sure that the crazy doesn't um, override it. I'd say that I'd say that I'd say those are a good set of guidelines, wouldn't you? Mm. I think Indeed. that's a solid starting point. Mm -hmm. And above all, no matter what. Never ever be, never ever look at Bobobo as your chief as your chief source of inspiration. <sighs> and I, I am, I know that you would, I know that you would prefer it to be shot into the sun. I would, I would argue that anyone who wants to do comedy writing should should be for, should be forced to watch it as a case study. Because as yeah. I've stated in the past. The best way to learn from life's pitfalls is to watch other people fall in them. Dumb. In that regard, I don't mind Bubba Bo still being a thing, but anyone who watches that sh this sh enjoys the show unironically, and I want to stress that unironically, to say that that is a good example of parody. I hope tonight we've proven that that is not the case and that there is a reason why I have the disdain I do for this anime. Because we've seen through all these other examples that while a lot of, many of them weren't perfect, they at least did a good job where it counted. And the ones that really did well, like Excel Saga and Azamanga Dayo, 
they showed how a parody could be done with with all of the elements we've had in place. Mm-hmm. So, I think at this point I can finally close the book on Bobo Bo and say, I am done with you. I never want to see you again. <laughs> Bobo Bo's the abusive ex you kicked out of your house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Actually, no, no. Because of how annoying, because of how annoying some of the characters are, um, Bobo Bo is jazz. Lol. <laughs> or if, or if I had, or if I, ha- or if I have to, if I have to go with it, would you? Shades, would you say that would you say that um Bobo Bo could be the next victim of the Uncle Phil Beal? <laughs> Somebody call Keith Flew, because we gotta do some yeating. That, that is my that is my one for for the night. Dude, you have used it wisely. <laughs> But that is going to do it for this for this particular ep- for this particular episode of the Geek Watch. We'll be back here next week with something a little Tokusats related, especially especially since it's a topic that even among Tokusats fans doesn't get talked about as much as it probably should. Mostly because a certain other company seems to t- seems to try and take hold of the market share. Yeah. But I also wanted to bring it up because you know how much I love contrast. Oh yes. And now I will I will note a cu- I will note a couple things. On Tuesday, probably probably around eight probably around eight ish eight thirty central, I will be doing a experimental live stream, and going over some of going over the. State of things to come now that I've get, now that I've gotten the up the um base part of the upgrades that I need for for this for my system. I do have a few interviews that I'm, that I'm going to be doing. The um, in fact, the rest of this month is going to be pretty stacked. And of course, of course, some of course that will include things like Veil of the Void. And remember, use code Two Monks to get ten percent off your purchase of Veil of the Void. And I will actually be a guest on someone on someone else's show next week. But that is a story for an- for another day. So until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>